They are upgrading those airfields so that they can support those bomber strikes into the heart of the United States. Uh, why? Again, when they have no threat uh, uh, coming from them, uh, toward them from the United States. If Mr. Gorbachev is really serious about uh, some of the things he's saying, why does he not simply discontinue that kind of, of development? Well, why are they doing it? Uh, I'd like, I don't know why they're doing it, but I would like to uh, give a suggestion at least out of a book called Soviet Strategy for Nuclear War from the uh, Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Because of the great importance attached to surprise in beginning a war, the Soviets emphasized that the threat period activities of the Soviet Union are to be conducted as covertly as possible. They write of the need for covert mobilization and of the use of training and exercise maneuvers to cover real preparations. Now, in Europe, we, we would expect that if they, if they did, in fact, launch a surprise attack against the United States, they would simultaneously attack NATO because they cannot afford, of course, to leave the NATO forces on their flank. And there are several things that have been very alarming to us that have happened in, in Europe within the, the same period of time, the last two and a half to three years. And three of those are this. They have gone to full wartime command structure. That is, they have staffed certain positions that they hold in their theater groups called their TVDs that they have never staffed since World War II. They have gone to full wartime communication systems. They have moved all of the munitions, munitions and supplies forward that are required for a full-scale invasion of Europe. Again, if Mr. Gorbachev is really serious, why does he not back off of those things? They have done that very slowly. It is, it is again, the old uh, the story of uh, how you cook a frog. You know, you put him in and you slowly raise the heat. That seems uh, to be occurring. Now, because of the nature of those statements, let me give you the direct quotes and sources on those. Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger, writing in March of 86. In 1985, the Soviets began activating peacetime high commands within the TVDs with high-ranking officers appointed as permanent commanders-in-chief. And over their, their central TVD, that would, be, would bear the brunt of any attack that they would make against Western Europe, they placed the man who was chief of staff, a man named Nikolai Ogurkov. They put him over the central TVD. That's the only time they have done that since the Second World War. From Senator Dan Quayle, who is a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee and the Subcommittee on Strategic and Theater Nuclear Forces, said in April of last year, by stockpiling Warsaw Pact fronts with enough military supplies for a major offensive, they have erased NATO's ability to glean advance warning of such an offense by monitoring troop movements. And then uh, General Bernard Rogers, who has just been relieved of command of NATO after many years of excellent service, said in November of last year, accompanying the doctrinal shift to operational maneuver groups, and let me say what they did was they reorganized their ground forces to operational maneuver groups. These are like super panzer divisions. They are designed for very quick lightning strikes against NATO's rear to seize our nuclear assets there and hopefully to end the war in a, ma in a very short period of time. Accompanying the doctrinal shift to OMGs has been a reorganization of the command and control system for their ground forces, with the result that the Soviets now have in operation during peacetime the same sea cube structure that they would use in wartime, again from the commander of NATO a man who is likely to know and understand that situation. Now let me share with you for a couple of moments just a few quotes from the Soviets themselves. What do they say in their own internal literature? And we have access to that. We've had defectors from the Soviet Union uh, bring with them uh, Soviet journals and we have translated that at the uh, Air Force's Foreign Technology Division at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, those things are now accessible. And so I will share with you a few of the, qu uh, the quotes from their literature. Well, let me share with you one problem that we have in actually making a, a detailed, accurate assessment of what their intentions might really be. The problem is they are the most secretive, totalitarian regime there has ever been in the history of mankind. For example, Dr. Richard Pipes of Harvard University, who is a, uh, uh, probably the leading authority on the Soviet Union, he's a professor of history there, and he's also been a, a member of the uh, National Security Council charged with determining Soviet strategic intentions, had access to all the right data. He says that we literally know more about the operation of the Roman Senate than we do about the Soviet Politburo. And I want you to know that's true in spite of Mr. Gorbachev's openness. He reveals nothing about the operations of the Politburo. So they remain very closed on the important issues. He also points out 
that we know more about the character and personality of Genghis Khan than we, know, than we knew about Andropov or Cherninko or most all of the Soviet leaders. In fact, it's been very unusual that we have known as much about Gorbachev uh, and his wife, in this particular case, as, uh, as we do. In fact, of past leaders, in some cases, we haven't even known if they were married or not because they are so secretive and closed that we could not determine that level of information. Winston Churchill has also said that there are no insignificant events in a totalitarian regime. And I would suggest to you the things that I am reviewing with you are not insignificant because they are centrally controlled. Whatever they do, they do with a plan and a purpose. Now let me get to those particular quotes that I mentioned. First, beginning with uh, Marshal uh, Moskalenko, who was Deputy Minister of Defense in 1969. And I will do these in chronological order. So notice the, the increase in arrogance of the Soviets as their abilities vis-a-vis -vis the United States begin to improve. He said, the launching of the first mass nuclear attack acquires decisive importance for achieving the objectives of war. Now, this is what is, is forming, nuclear, uh, forming the military thought in the Soviet Union, you see. Uh, he's writing in a, in a Soviet publication. He said that he points out how important it is to make sure you launch first. And then, a few years later in 1972, again by a, a Soviet colonel, there is profound error and harm in the disorienting claims of bourgeois ideologies that there will be no victor in a thermonuclear war. The peoples of the world will put an end to imperialism, which is causing mankind incalculable suffering. There is no statement equivalent to that that I have ever found in Western military literature. Then in 1978, Premier Kosygin said, Russia and its allies will control the high seas, space, and most of the world's landmass by the early 1980s. Clearly he missed it, uh, but they've got a plan. They haven't given up on the plan at all, but for some reason uh, they, they have not proceeded according to the plan, but we still remain in an extremely dangerous situation. Andropov said in 79, imperialism accepted detente not because it wished to, but because it was forced to. It was compelled to accept detente because the correlation of forces in the world arena changed in favor of socialism. The principal, principal force that they're talking about is strategic nuclear forces. Ma uh, Nikolai Ogorkov, who I referred to earlier, back in 79 when he was still the chief of the Soviet general staff said, the Soviet Union has military superiority over the United States. Henceforth, the United States will be threatened. It had better get used to it. Then in 1984, after being made the commander that I mentioned previously over some of the forces facing NATO, said the following, socialism, is firmly established and there is no force capable of stopping its victorious march around the world. And then the most recent statement, reporting in, a, in an issue of U.S. and News and World Report that you may have at home, the July the 1st, uh, 87 issue, Alexander Yakolev, who is a candidate member of the Soviet Communist Party uh, Politburo, said, we have concluded that it is difficult for Americans to attack us with nuclear weapons. We lived in the fear of such a possibility for three decades, but not anymore. I can promise you that there will be many an occasion that we shall again astonish you in the West. I think it's significant that he talks about astonishing us in the same context of, uh, of using nuclear weapons. Let me share with you just a couple of quotes of other analysts and what they have said as they've looked at the Soviet military literature. In a study uh, published uh, in a text called Soviet Strategy for Nuclear War, published by the Hoover Institute at Stanford, it says the preponderant base of evidence in the Soviet literature designed for an internal use calls for their striking first against the West with maximum surprise when the situation calls for war and when the factors are in the Soviet favor, as I might add, as they are today. Dr. Richard Pipes of, uh, of Harvard University, in the book that he wrote and published in 85 called Survival is Not Enough, says in Soviet doctrine, nuclear weapons do not serve primarily deterrent purposes. They are the principal instrument of modern war absolutely reversed from the United States. They are not the instrument of modern war for us. They serve only deterrence purposes for us. Jean Kirkpatrick again, in kind of addressing the situation that the fact that the Reagan administration has been uh, really desperately trying to address the situation, but it takes so long to deploy a strategic nuclear weapon system uh, that uh, you can't redress it very quickly. So what has happened is that we've got a lot of systems that are in the pipeline, but they're just not available yet. And she said some progress has been made in restoring American strength. But each year, the Soviet advantage increases. Many people ask, well, if they have this great advantage, why don't they use it right now? Why haven't they already used it? She just answered that. It gets better for them every year. 
and hey, this is for all the marbles. This is the biggie. And they're not going to take a chance on doing it prematurely. As she points out, it gets better. When they make the judgment that it's as good as it's ever going to get because of our deployments of offensive and defensive systems, there then will be an unprecedented, unparalleled opportunity in the history of the Soviet Union for them to instantaneously attain the goals that they've been striving for for many years. Will they do it? I don't know whether they will do it. I'm giving you some of the information so you can make some of the assessments. Now on the issue of civil defense, the administration has realized that uh, there is a great need for civil defense. We are virtually defenseless. And I mean that's literally true. We have no viable civil defense at all in the United States. And I'm not saying anything that the head of FEMA does not totally agree with. I mean, it's, it's clear. There, there is no question on that particular issue. And Dr. Carney might want to address that. He is an expert on that particular issue. Let me refer to an article written uh, very recently, May of 87, appears in the American Legion magazine by Philip Clark. He said it's called America the Vulnerable. In that article, he says, in 1982, the administration, recognizing the alarming rate of U.S. unpreparedness, proposed a six-year, $4.2 billion buildup in our civil defenses. The White House proposal was shot down before reaching a floor vote in Congress. In that same article, he pointed out the White House is now trying a new approach. On February the 4th of this year, President Reagan, without fanfare, issued National Security Directive Number 259, calling for a beefed up civil defense capable of protecting our population and resources in the event of nuclear attack. Now that's very significant. Uh, there's two bits of evidence that I would, I would give to you that would show that President Reagan realizes how, the seriousness of the situation. The giving of the launch codes to the submarine commanders and the issuing of National Security Directive number 259. Now that was done, again, openly in February of this year. Let me just ask you a question, this audience, and let you respond by a show of hands. How many of you here knew, before I just told you, that National Security Directive 259 had been issued? Could I see your hands? Okay, that represents, and Dr. Carney, of course, is one of those specialists, and uh, Gary Clayton here, and I saw probably another eight hands out of this, out of this audience. That represents probably a 2% of this audience, and yet that was public information. Why didn't you know? Because the press simply does not cover it. I mean, it's just that simple. They do not cover it. Well, let me address now the type of scenario I, I have suggested that, that could possibly happen. A scenario whether, where they might use an electromagnetic pulse from satellites over the United States, and again, they have the capability to do that immediately, to disrupt C cubed I, simultaneously with that pulse, launching from submarines off the Atlantic Pacific coast, simultaneously with that, launching from ICBMs inside the Soviet Union, simultaneously with that, the bombers taking off of the fields and heading for North America. Now, what would happen if they did that, and three minutes after the submarines launched, the weapons who were targeted uh, at the targets close to the coast, and we have many, would begin detonating. 15 minutes after the, they'd begun, uh, they'd be finished their work. 20 minutes after the ICBMs uh, launched, they would uh, be detonating, and 25 to 30 minutes thereafter, they'd be finished. And then a few hours after, the bombers would come over those, those targets, and we see them talking about this in their literature, by the way, this is exactly what they would do. The bombers would come over their targets, and they would, if there was any target that they missed, they would clean it up. Now, except for the bomber operation, it would be over in 30 minutes. That is, if they would have launched such an attack when you came into this meeting, it would have been over uh, 45 minutes ago. That's the situation that we live in in this day and time. It is an incredible situation, like Gene Kirkpatrick said, almost impossible to believe, to remember, or to cope with. Nevertheless, it is absolutely the fact. Now, let me show you the kinds of targets that they would have. There's only 60 major target areas to totally decapitate the United States. Here's, uh, here they are. Notice that there are nine missile fields. Notice that one of the major missile fields is in the heart of the United States at Whitman Air Force Base in central Missouri. This uh, particular field uh, even has a launch control center in Jackson County. It is the, it is the dark uh, circles here that are the prime targets. Notice that there is one at Hill Air Force Base because of the CQ guy that's located there, CQ guy in, in Utah. And notice the others. Now again, uh, notice that there are not many major cities that are hit. Uh, San Francisco is because uh, it has a lot of uh, strategically important targets there. But notice that uh, most of the major cities are not hit. Uh, again, they're not targeted against major cities. In fact, you don't want to hit the major cities. What they want to do is hold the cities hostage. 
And they do not want to give us the, a suicidal complex in this regard to make us think that, that it's totally over. They want to give us something to protect by yielding and stopping the conflict. They would like to attack and stop in 30 minutes. As soon as their, attack, their strike hits, they would like to stop because that would leave them in the position of the only major strategic nuclear power in the world. And uh, that, this is the ideal Leninist scenario where now Marxist revolutions can go forth unimpeded. That's what they'd like. Not necessarily red troops in America, but uh, where, in fact, they've got now total control of the world. That is, we're no longer a world power. We're severely damaged. Now, another misconception is that if there were... And there are many misconceptions, by the way. And I would like to recommend uh, the reading of Dr. Carney's book because he has a chapter in there that talks about myths, nuclear myths. And there are many that the American people believe. And you see, you see them all the time in the press. One of those myths is that everybody is going to die because of nuclear radiation. That is simply not the case. Do not misunderstand. Nuclear weapons are enormously destructive, but they are principally enormously destructive in the vicinity of the area they detonate. Now, there is some radiation from them, but in the case of an airburst, that is a burst above several thousand feet, which is the kind of attack they would use on all of the soft targets in the United States, like the airburst, just like at Hill, when they have that type of airburst, there is virtually no fallout from that. When they have a ground burst, that is one that you like, you have to have if you're going to attack the silos, or to get those silos, you've got to get in on the ground, the blast does scoop up a lot of material and put it through the fireball, and it does become radioactive. So it's the fallout then that is going to be east of those missile fields, that is, with the prevailing winds that way, east of the missile fields, those are going to be the areas which will have a, a significant fallout time. But even in terms of fallout, as, as uh, Crescent Carney points out, the radioactive decay is exponential. That means it decays very rapidly. The danger period, the really critical danger period, is a very short period of time for most of the isotopes that are produced in a, uh, a nuclear weapon. There are some isotopes that have very long half-lives, and therefore they do have some damage that goes on for a long period of time. But uh, that is another matter. Uh, for example, I heard a talk uh, recently, well, last fall, by uh, Hans Mark, former Secretary of the Air Force and a former Deputy Director of NASA. And he pointed out that in the big accident at Chernobyl, which was a major nuclear accident, I mean, it was a full-scale meltdown there, which means they pumped out all kinds of isotopes into the environment. The local authorities there tried to suppress that. You know, Moscow denied it for three days. And he says the reason they denied it, they didn't know it. He said this time they weren't lying. The local officials hadn't told them. And he said, our, satellite, uh, our satellites took photographs of it the day after it happened, and there, within a half a mile of that facility, just, just belching radioactive particles out, was a soccer game going on, full soccer teams and full spectators. And then he makes this point. Those people didn't die. They're in trouble. A lot of them are going to die early from cancer, but they did not die. And those deaths that they did have, he said, we think the number of deaths they've quoted, because we had doctors in there and as you know, that they have to come in. We think their number of deaths is accurate. It was not a very large number. And he pointed out that there's about 100 million people affected by the fallout of that. And over the next 30 to 40 years, there will be at most 50 to 60,000 of those that will die of cancer related to the Chernobyl accident. But in the same period of time, there will be 30 to 40 million of them who will die of other causes, which means statistically you can't even measure the effect of Chernobyl on those populations. Now, you know, that is the true story of it. Uh, it, is, it is a problem. You must deal with it. But it is not the, the, the problem that we often are led to believe because it's sensational and they want us to believe, and frankly, it contributes to the fear mechanism that, uh, that many people have. Well, let's look at a realistic fallout map then under those circumstances. Uh, you can see here that, uh, that there would be direct explosions that I pointed out in Missouri. Also, the prevailing winds would bring uh, much fallout from the uh, Nebraska and Kansas fields right over that central area of Missouri and it would be highly contaminated. There would be a period of time when uh, perhaps uh, no one uh, could live there. Now let me uh, summarize with some of the ominous signs that we have seen from the Soviet Union. And there are many. I'm going to give you just a few of those. We have seen them intensely gathering both targeting data and trajectory data. Robert T. Harries, who at the time was the commander of uh, NORAD, said that in 1985 we observed 500 launches inside the Soviet Union. Now that's staggering. Uh, that was about 100 space launches and 400 military launches, 400 military testing ICBM systems and other type of missile systems. Uh, comparisons of our figures, we launched, as you saw, the space launches I gave you on, on a former slide, we had about 20 space launches and about 20 uh, launches developing our missile systems. For example, 
the entire MX development program, which is a major missile system for us, we have 20 launches to, to qualify that entire system, only 20. They had 400 in one year. Now, we know what they were doing. They were getting extensive targeting data by launching out of the center of the Soviet Union uh, into uh, their test range off of Kamchatka. And they were launching many missiles simultaneously uh, with many warheads, laying them down two on one. And as we look at the patterns that they, that they are attacking, they exactly correspond to the silo locations and the launch command control centers of our Minuteman fields. They're practicing against our fields. Now, does it mean it's good they're going to hit them? Well, I don't know, but they're practicing against them. We do nothing like that in return. I mean, we don't even have that many spare missiles to use. Uh, and, and it's an enormous expense they do that. That's called targeting data. They have also been getting trajectory data. That is, they literally launch from operational silos inside the Soviet Union at the United States. No nuclear warhead. In fact, probably no nose cone or heat shield. They don't want it to, to reenter. They want it to burn up. But they let it fly over the polar caps, and then they blow it up, destroying it. And what they're getting is trajectory data because they need to understand the effects of the Earth's magnetic and gravitational fields on the trajectory in order to be able to hit the targets inside the United States accurately. We have never obtained such data. They are intensely obtaining that kind of data. Will they use it? I cannot know, but they're obtaining it. We have also seen them practicing routinely now first strike against the United States. Remember that quote I gave you from the analyst that said in their, li their literature, they say they would have these kind of training and exercise programs so that we would no longer respond or go on alert, and we don't as they practice uh, these things. The deployment I mentioned earlier, the SS-24 and 25, the large phased array radar at Krasner Yarsk. I'm sure you, that you've read some about that. That is a stark violation of the ABM treaty, and yet that's only one of nine such radars that comprise their full battlefield management system that they would use in connection with the anti-ballistic missile system that they are currently developing. It has been estimated that they have spent as much as $200 billion over the last 15 years in strategic defense, and yet they continuously attack SDI as a threat to the world, when we've spent only a tiny fraction on SDI of that, of that kind of money. Again, there is no single element required for a successful first strike against the United States that they are not intensely pursuing. Well, I'd like to sort of summarize with two quotes, one by Gene Kirkpatrick. The United States and Europe are already vulnerable to attack by the Soviet Union. How much more vulnerable do we dare to become to a power that daily demonstrates its will and skill in the use of deadly force? And then from a, a Dr. Richard Pipes, again of Harvard University, one that addresses why this attention to a Soviet strategy. He said, it is essential for anyone concerned with nuclear weapons whether in a professional capacity or as a layman, to familiarize himself with Soviet nuclear doctrines and programs. They are the reality against which the United States strategies and programs must be matched. In all deliberations on the matter at the public level, the issue should not be the settling of old scores between American liberals and conservatives, nor the undisputed horrors of nuclear war, nor American so America's social and other domestic needs, but solely the nature and extent of the Soviet threat. Any statement on the subject of nuclear weapons and strategy that fails to address itself to this central subject ought to be dismissed as irrelevant. That's why it is such an important issue. Uh, again, we must respond to the threat that we face. Now, I would like for just a few minutes to share with you some of the comments by leaders of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, because there's many people that say to me from time to time, you know, if something like this were going to happen, why wouldn't the brethren say something about it? And I would like to suggest to you that, uh, that perhaps they have if we simply knew what uh, we were listening to by giving you a few very uh, direct comments uh, from what they had said. April of 1979, Elder Bruce R. McConkie, standing in General Conference of the Church, said, we do not know when the calamities and troubles of the last days will fall upon any of us as individuals or upon bodies of the saints. The Lord deliberately withholds from us the day and hour of his coming and of the tribulations which shall precede it, all as part of the testing and probationary experiences of mortality. He simply tells us to watch and be ready. And then, in that same uh, the talk, in fact, at his introduction of that talk, he said, I stand before the church this day and raise the warning voice. It is a prophetic voice, for I shall say only what the apostles and prophets have spoken concerning our day. It is a voice calling upon the Lord's people to prepare for the troubles and desolations which are about to be poured out upon the world without measure. He said, for the moment, we live in a day of peace and prosperity, but it shall not ever be thus. 
great trials lie ahead. All of the sorrows and perils of the past are but a foretaste of what is yet to be. And we must prepare ourselves temporally and spiritually. He said, we do not say that all of the saints will be, sa be spared and saved from the coming day of desolation. But we do say there is no promise of safety and no promise of security except for those who love the Lord and who are seeking to do all that he commands. And then he said, it may be, for instance, that nothing except the power of faith and the authority of the priesthood can save individuals and congregations from the atomic holocaust that surely shall be. And so he said, we raise the warning voice and say, take heed, prepare, watch and be ready. There is no security in any course except the course of obedience and conformity and righteousness. Now, uh, President uh, Marion G. Romney stood right behind him in that same conference and said the following. You ought to now, more than at any previous time, make sure that you are prepared to go through a period of stress on the resources you have prepared for yourselves. The necessity to do this may come any day. And then President Romney in September of that same year said, identifying clearly who he's talking about, Communism is Satan's counterfeit for the gospel plan, and it is an avowed enemy of the God of the land. Communism is the greatest antichrist power in the world today, and therefore the greatest menace not only to our peace, but to our preservation as a free people. Then President Ezra Taft Benson, the current president of our church, said, Never before has the land of Zion appeared so vulnerable to so powerful an enemy as the Americas do at present. Notice he used the same word that Gene Kirkpatrick and many others did, vulnerable. There are some things we can and must do at once if we are to stave off a holocaust of destruction. And then he listed four things, and I'm not going to review those with you. You might want to go home and read in the, uh, uh, the proceedings of the October 1979 conference, which are, which are in the uh, November 79 ensign. Uh, but we as a people have not done those four things uh, that he clearly uh, brought to our attention at that uh, period of time. He said further in October of 1980, we do, we do know that the Lord has decreed global calamities for the future and has warned and forewarned us to be prepared. For this reason, the brethren have repeatedly stressed a back-to-basics program for temporal and spiritual welfare. Notice he says, for this reason, what reason? Global calamities. They have given the instruction. Would what we've been discussing tonight be a global calamity? Uh, I suggest that it perhaps would. And then in October of 80, that same talk, he said, too often we bask in our comfortable complacency and rationalize that the ravages of war, economic disaster, famine, and earthquake cannot happen here. Those who believe this are either not acquainted with the revelations of the Lord or they do not believe them. Those who smugly think these calamities will not happen, that they somehow will be set aside because of the righteousness of the saints are deceived and will rue the day they harbored such a delusion. And then in that same talk, he said, the revelation to produce and store food may be as essential to our temporal welfare today as boarding the ark was to the people in the days of Noah. That's been reiterated about three conferences ago. Uh, that is an extremely important statement because we all know what happened to those who did not board the ark. It is important that we respond to the, to the direction and leadership being given by the president of the church. And then he said, those families will be fortunate who in the last days have an adequate supply of food because of their foresight and ability to produce their own. We urge you to do this prayerfully and do it now. I speak with a feeling of great urgency, he said. And then he said, the Lord has warned and forewarned us against the day of great tribulation and has given us counsel through his servants on how we can be prepared for these difficult times. Have we heeded his counsel? Be faithful, my brothers and sisters, to this counsel and you will be blessed. Yes, the most blessed people in all the earth. Now, I'm, I am not suggesting to you tonight that I know this is going to happen. I cannot know. What I know is, is what you, I hope, know now is that the Soviets have intensely prepared themselves. The mechanism is in place. If you want to look at the signs of the times, it certainly has to be one of the key signs of the times. And we know that there has never been a totalitarian regime on the face of the earth. Whoever had the technological advantage that they hold over us from the Assyrians to the present time who did not use it. That is, the historical imperative is not for conservative in this particular uh, case. It is for them to use what they have developed at such an enormous sacrifice. Now, many will say that the Soviets are paranoid about their defense. 
Remember the quote that I gave from the current uh, candidate member of the, of the Politburo. He said, we don't fear the Americans any longer, you see. Uh, that just simply does not hold up any longer under the enormous buildup uh, that they are having. And in fact, in their literature, they talk about uh, the Western scenario of uh, increasing escalation, beginning, uh, leading to a war. They say there's no circumstances under which they would do that, that they would buy into that scenario. And the reason is this. It places the American strategic nuclear forces at our highest degree of alert, and therefore they would suffer the greatest damage in the Soviet Union. They don't want to suffer damage. They say that under those circumstances, they would back down. They would back down even if it meant yielding Soviet territory to the point that we uh, went off of alert, and then when we were not prepared for it, they would strike. But what they prefer, and they call it the preferred variant, that's their word, is first strike against the United States with absolutely no warning whatsoever. In fact, in an environment of peace negotiations or arms limitation talks, cultural exchanges, uh, athletic teams uh, being exchanged, et cetera, et cetera, those type of things. Precisely the same type of thing we see in the world today. They are potentially very dangerous. There has never been in the history of mankind a period of time as dangerous as the time in which we live. Again, I do not know what shall happen, but I do know that we need to heed the words of the prophet of God upon this earth and to prepare ourselves as he has indicated. I will entertain questions uh, at this time, and uh, uh, Lieutenant Clayton had indicated that we have a mic here uh, that you can either come down to or that you bring up there if you'd like, if you have a question. Dr. Callens, could you yes. speak very specifically and describe the criteria that define the boundaries of the window of, of vulnerability that you've mentioned and okay. exactly how we can perhaps know uh, what uh, describes that and when, okay. it might, when it might end or... That's right. an excellent question. Now remember that, that I had indicated that our doctrine had been for several decades mutually assured destruction. And what was happening was that the Soviets were developing these offensive systems and hardening those systems to such an extent that we could no longer destroy them. That is, that we could no longer assure their destruction. Now, when they began their tremendous buildup and began deploying particular, particularly their SS-18 Mod 4, uh, and that, that deployment was completed in 1982, they then had the capability of uh, certainly eliminating the ICBMs and of eliminating most of the other targets that I have indicated at that, at that time. So really, the window, the opening of the window was approximately that year, was about 82. So we have been into it now for several years. The closing of the window would be when we either developed an offensive force that now could threaten all of those targets, a survivable offensive force, okay, both survivable and penetrable, uh, then we would be back to the position of mutually assured destruction. That is, it would be too dangerous for them to do something like this. They would take far too much damage in their own territory. Or if they developed a, def or if we developed rather, a defensive system that would allow us to uh, knock out enough of their attacking force so that they could not be assured of, of destroying our retaliatory capability and therefore, again, they would take too much damage in the Soviet Union. Now, when is that likely to occur? Well, again, uh, I have to estimate that. I cannot know for sure, and there is disagreement among the analysts. The earliest it could possibly occur right now is probably 89, two years from now. And that would be if the advanced cruise missile, which is a, a stealth cruise missile, okay, that's one that has a very low radar cross-section. That look-down, shoot-down capability won't help them there because this thing has such a low radar cross-section, they can't pick it out from the ground clutter, okay? So if we, when we get to the point that we can mount those on B-1Bs, so we've got a survivable launch platform that can get away and get those launched outside of their air defenses, then it is possibly possible at that time that we could again threaten these targets. Even though the cruise missiles have a very low yield target on them, they have pinpoint accuracy. So consequently, they can hit right on them. Now again, you've got to weigh that against what might happen in the development of Soviet defenses. If they were develop sufficient defenses, then that time would be prolonged. Another weapon system that's coming that will relieve that situation somewhat is the Trident II missile called the D-5 that is now under development and will go in the tubes of the Ohio-class submarines. We already have the submarines built and are continuing to build them, but we don't have the advanced missile in them yet. But the missile will be, it's being tested now. In fact, you may have read in the, the papers that we began testing it down at uh, Canaveral in Florida some months ago and there were demonstrations down there and so forth trying to prevent that testing. 
But we've continued with that testing, been very successful. So in 89, we'll be prepared to put those into the tubes and they'll be ready. So again, that is a hard target killer on submarines. Again, as far as we can tell now, a survivable platform that could launch against their most precious assets. So uh, that may indeed shift it back to a, a mature, uh, mutually assured destruction. But again, you have to weigh that against what will be the advances in Soviet submarine detection. Let me tell you, the walkers did enormous damage to this country, enormous damage. Uh, not only that, the, uh, uh, as you've read in the paper, the Japanese company and the Norwegian company did enormous damage to us also in selling uh, to the Soviets uh, uh, this capability of having much quieter submarines themselves. So those things leave you a big unknown. See, we cannot tell what they might have at this time. For example, they're working on synthetic aperture radar from space designed particularly to detect our submarines in the ocean. If they were to complete that, the ocean now would be, would be transparent. That is, they could see the submarines with their sensors and uh, we would not have that deterrent anymore. Well, we don't think they'll have it developed by that time, but we can't tell for sure. So there is some uncertainty there, but the very earliest that it could be is two years from now. In the meantime, right now, from this point on until that period of time is exceptionally dangerous. It is the most dangerous time we've ever had in history because the Soviet Union has this option, which they did not have 10 years ago or 15 years ago. They have it now. Okay? Dr. Cowens, uh, having worked within the military intelligence structure of the country and from classified sources, I've known for many years of what you've been talking about tonight, and it has been alarming. Yes. My question for you is, with this young 19-year-old German pilot in his 172 that penetrated the sophisticated radar network in the USSR, yes. uh, my feeling is, after reading the initial accounts of it, that while he was flying NOE, he was not detected. It was only until he went to altitude that he was, in fact, intercepted. And so far, I've read that he was only intercepted once, and then that was of no consequence when he went back down to ground level. Uh, do you think he bought us some time? Well, that's entirely possible. That is an excellent question, because certainly that, that had to cause uh, the Soviets to think about the effectiveness of their air defense systems. And, and clearly, uh, they're doing that. So it is entirely possible that that bought us time. Again, not knowing what their time schedule might be, I could not tell for sure. But uh, clearly, an event of that, of that magnitude would have some effect on them, and I would hope would shake th their confidence and the competence of their computer models, which are calculating the probabilities of success of, of uh, such an event. I'm wondering if you're aware also of how much of a shakeup and a cleansing of the, uh, the uh, uh, C2 functions in the Home Defense Force, uh, how much of a purge there was. Are you acquainted with anything there? Well, uh, I'm acquainted with just what has been in the press to this point. And of course, you're talking about now within the Soviet Union again, right? That's correct. Yes. I understand the top commanders that, that, of the that's right. that, were that, sacked, and it's that's questionable right. as to whether they're alive today. Is that right? Well, I don't. I really, you know, they haven't gone back to their old system of executing people in a long time. I, particularly with Gorbachev's openness, I really doubt that they would do that. But the uh, chief of staff, who is Sokolov, was in fact relieved of command, and others have been relieved of command. I understand that the local air commander, uh, who uh, had, would not shoot this uh, Piper Cub down because apparently they did see them at least one time, has been relieved of command, and the man put in his place was in fact the pilot who shot down the Korean airliner. That gives you some idea of their thought in this matter, you know, of, of who they want in those positions. So uh, again, the thing we always have to be aware of is so much Soviet disinformation. You know, how much can we really believe? You know, I can't, cannot tell for sure what the significance of that would be. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Callens, could you please uh, d elaborate on what you mean by an unprotected um, integrated circuit? And okay. Do we or do we not have the capacity to to harden those circuits against uh, the effects of EMP? Yes. Okay. Let me answer the, the last question first. And in, in fact, we do have the capability to harden the integrated circuits against the effect of EMP. It is expensive, uh, and in the commercial world. Of course, for civilian type things, that expense would be unbearable. Uh, that is, you wouldn't be competitive if you did that. The military, though, has been uh, rapidly doing that. In fact, uh, you're probably aware that this C cubed I has our highest priority. And in fact, President Reagan, in his own words, he described it as having the highest possible uh, priority. We have spent 30 billion a year, for example, on uh, C cubed I uh, of these past several years trying to resolve that problem. Now, let me sh uh, share with you how, as civilians, you might protect your systems. Uh, for example, if you had uh, TV, uh, radio, those type of things, 
if you unplug them and disconnect them from the antennas, the probability of their survival is very great. And the reason is, in order to knock them out, it takes a, uh, a pulse that is being transmitted over a conductor into those systems. So that conductor can be the electrical lines themselves or the antenna lines themselves. So you take them off the conductor and there's simply not enough density of the EMP locally to destroy the integrated circuits for most cases. So that means portable radios, for example, that you had, uh, that you had disconnected would probably survive. One further way of enhancing the survival would be to take uh, a piece of electronic equipment and to put it in a metal box and ground the box. Then the pulse goes off into the ground and doesn't go through the electronic components. Uh, the, a way to uh, do that, for example, is to put it in a filing cabinet and ground the filing cabinet, or to put it in a metal garbage can or that sort of thing. So there are ways to ground uh, radios, TVs, uh, shortwave radios, and that type of thing in order to make them survival of the, uh, to the, due to the EMP. But the fact of the matter is virtually all of the integrated circuits in America that are in the civilian sector are, are in fact unprotected, and uh, they would be uh, lost or severely damaged in, in such a, an attack. Yes, ma'am? I have two questions. Okay. Um, I know that none of us know when or if anything will happen, but in your educated opinion, uh, according to what you've said, within two years we have the capability of closing this window again. Yes. Do you think that that seems that that increases our chances that if they're going to do it, if they really plan to do it, that they would do it within the next two years before we can close that window? Yes, I certainly think that that, that is true because if they're going to do it, obviously it is to their advantage to strike at a time when the window is at its maximum. Now, when will that be? Well, I've given you some of my thoughts on that area, in that area, but it doesn't really matter what I think, it's what the Soviets think. See, they're analyzing this same situation, and they know things about their own internal systems that I couldn't possibly know, and that will have great influence on them. So they might, for example, be developing, as Dr. Jastrow says, a complete ABM system for the defense of the entire Soviet homeland. And they might feel that that's more important than some of the things we're developing, and they would wait on that development. See, we have to, to know that, we'd have to be able to weight it as they do, the importance of these various developments. But clearly, the next two years is an extremely dangerous time. Now, again, we would, we would uh, eliminate some of the danger that we have by going back to a mutually assured destruction. See, these are offensive systems I'm talking about. But President Reagan points out that he feels that the, that the ultimate uh, uh, situation we ought to be in is a defensive one where we would build a system that would in fact be capable of knocking down some significant portion of their attack so that they could not be assured that they could get our offensive uh, forces. In other words, it would give real credence to uh, assured destruction, not necessarily mutual in this case. A second question okay. is, uh, the church has told us to store food, clothing, and fuel for a year. Yes. They've never said anything about water, and I don't understand anything about the how water would become radioactive. It's very difficult to store a significant amount of water. Yes. You can store a few weeks or a month. Right. They have mentioned uh, water in the past, that we ought to have an adequate supply of water. Now, one important point here, uh, and again, uh, points that, uh, that Crescent Carney has uh, uh, made also, is that the food is not damaged by being irradiated. And the water is not damaged. If you have water in a closed container and radiation passes through, it doesn't hurt the water. What you do not want to do is to ingest the radioactive particles, of course. You would not want to drink water that had the radioactive particles in it. But uh, it is important to store enough water so that you could survive while water resources uh, were being obtained, and that is while it was being restored. Clearly, there's a lot of water around, and as I mentioned, residual radiation in most areas will not be a significant problem. Therefore, we could go to uh, uh, groundwater uh, and surface water uh, sources uh, after uh, some short period of time. You could dig a well, for example. In some areas you can dig a well. And the, and the water uh, from the subsurface would be good. But you need uh, an ample supply to get you to that point. Thank you. Okay. I just have one question. Yes. My question is, um, you mentioned Europe being simultaneously attacked. Yes. Um, are you aware of anything are you aware of anything differently being done in Europe than what is being done in the United States? Uh, for the attack? Mm -hmm. Well, um, our intelligence sources uh, that I'm familiar with do not have evidence of plans for uh, any invasion of the United States. However, we have seen uh, significant indication, of course, of, massive, of uh, plans for massive attack in, uh, uh, in NATO countries. 
And again, the reason for that is you've got, they've got big military forces that are on their flank, and they've simply got to eliminate those and eliminate them very quickly. Not necessarily destroy all the forces, but they've got to at least seize the nuclear assets there. That's one of the reasons they are so very interested in a, a, a treaty that would ban all nuclear forces from Europe. They don't want to have to use uh, nuclear weapons anywhere if they could get away with it, and particularly in Europe. They honestly want to wear the white hats. You know, they want to say to the world, hey, we're the good guys. This, uh, the United States was heading the world for a nuclear holocaust. This SDI was going to kill everybody, and we have saved you from that by surgical strikes on the United States, and we had to, of course, attack their forces and yours in Europe, but we're not going to do you any harm because we're really nice. You've seen that from the, the openness that we have in our own society now. And, and they honestly want to wear the white hats and cast us with the guys with the black hats. So, so again, a lot of what's happening with this openness in terms of that scenario appears to be very dangerous because of their continued buildup, the things I mentioned of what they're doing in Europe and the bear bomber exercises and so forth that continue absolutely unabated, in fact, even accelerating, in spite of the fact that they say that they're trying to back off from all of this. It would give us some hint that maybe there is another plan afoot. Okay, and so we you. need to prepare. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, I have six questions to fire to you. <laughs> okay. Will will SDI actually work against a Soviet first strike, or will it be sold out by the present administration? Well, uh, I, be I believe that uh, SDI will work, and in fact, the George C. Marshall Institute and uh, High Frontier, which is the organization that uh, Lieutenant General uh, Danny Graham heads, have done uh, very extensive studies with just outstanding researchers on this, and they show that with technology that we currently have in hand and in fact have demonstrated, and I worked on the development of uh, two of these principal systems, and we, we have actually uh, tested them now in actual uh, flight testing, they've been extremely successful, that we could deploy those systems, and they would in fact uh, destroy a significant portion of the attacking force. They wouldn't destroy it all. And some have argued, well, even if a few get through, it's going to do great destruction. That's only if you believe they're aiming at the cities. They're not aiming at the cities. They're aiming at our strategic nuclear forces. Therefore, if we can destroy enough of that so that they can't be certain of getting those, like if they couldn't be certain of getting the C cubed died, boy, they'd have to really think about it. And that would be the circumstances they were in if we had a defensive system of any type at all. So certainly it is to our advantage. And yes, it does work. The technological advantages, uh, advances rather that we have made in the last two years have been astonishing. In fact, uh, uh, General Abramson, who is the, uh, uh, the uh, commander of the SDI program, has said that we have cut 10 years off of the deployment of a uh, full-scale SDI system through the research that we've had. And I believe that's true from analyzing uh, the results that have been uh, produced there. Go ahead. Question two. Is the Telsir, Telsis scalar weapon a part of the Soviet first strike, or is its function is as the EMP? Well, uh, you know, there is no uh, scientific evidence that I'm aware that, uh, that uh, the uh, uh, Tulsa uh, weapon, in, in fact, uh, works or that they've got it operational. You know, I know that there is a lot of speculation uh, by Mr. Bearden, uh, for example, from Huntsville, but uh, I know of no, uh, no hard evidence that, in fact, that is the case. I suspect it perhaps is not the case because a weapon of that nature would be so, uh, uh, would have such uh, high performance that they wouldn't need a lot of the rockets that they have now, if they had that. Uh, why would they keep expending these great expenditures you see if they had that? So again, uh, there's no evidence that, that that is the case. Has Russian pilot Viktor Belenko disclosed military secrets to our government since he entered the US? Uh, that I don't know. I have not seen any reports on, you know, on the information that uh, we uh, have gotten from him. But uh, typically, of course, when they do come over, uh, they have information that's very valuable to us. So I would anticipate the answer to that would be yes, but again, I've, I've not seen any, any data to know, assert. It's no secret that we sell or trade our technology to Russia, not only our agri-products and our wartime products. So why is this treason being permitted at all, and why did it start in the first place, knowing the Russians would eventually use it against us? Well, Pre President Reagan and uh, Secretary Weinberger have gone to great lengths to try to curb the flow of our technology into the Soviet Union. Now, it's been greatly resisted by uh, a lot of uh, factors in America, by a lot of commercial interests, and it's been greatly resisted by a lot of engineers and scientists, frankly, that do not understand the importance of this issue. Uh, I mentioned the look-down, shoot-down capability from the F-18. They have, they have gotten literally tens of billions of dollars worth of technology from us, money they did not have to spend 
uh, and gave them very advanced capabilities. And, and realize again what the danger is to this happening. They do not have a democratic system, so they do not have to go through congressional approval, environmental impact statements, and all the many other things that are aspects of a democratic society. Therefore, they can take the, the research and development and they can put it in an operational system in a fraction of the time that we could. That's why Secretary Weinberg has gone to such great lengths to protect the stealth bomber secrets. As far along as we are with the stealth, they could probably take the stealth bomber secrets right now and put a stealth bomber in the skies operational before we can because they do not have all the checks and balances and, and that we do in our system. And I favor those balances, by the way. I favor all the institutions in a democratic society, uh, but it is one of the disadvantages you have when you're up against a totalitarian regime who has none of those restrictions. So consequently, it's highly dangerous. In fact, we are ahead of them in research and development. That's another point that many people don't understand. We're ahead of them in many areas in R&D. Where we are behind them is in deployed systems. See, they deploy quickly, we do not. If we could take all of our technology and turn it right now into operational systems, that military comparison would, would change dramatically. Lastly, has there been an established prognosis that implies sabotage by the Soviets on our space station program? Uh, nothing, no, nothing that I have seen that would be validated. Of course, there's some speculation of that. We had last year, for example, we had many uh, disasters of major rocket systems all at the same time. Incidentally, they've had a couple on theirs. Their big proton boosters had two major failures in the same period of time. It's also grounded right now, just like our space shuttle, while they're looking at that. Now, again, that could be all part of their ploy to make us not think that anything to do with it, you know, in terms of their uh, disinformation. But I have seen no evidence to that effect. Thank you very much. But, you know, it, it could be because of the nature of who we're dealing with. Thank you very okay. much. I just have two questions. Okay. Um, one is, what preparations or what protections have the Soviets made against an EMP problem? And second, um, why do we maintain the current weapons forces, such as the B-52 and the uh, Minutemans, ICBMs, if they are currently obsolete? Okay, good. Uh, and you may have to remind me of the second question while I answer the first one. I may forget it. The, uh, the EMP uh, in the Soviet Union, of course, they would be subject to the same uh, mechanisms that we are in that regard. However, they are not as micro-miniaturized as we are in their electronic equipment because they're not as far well-developed as we are. Therefore, they do not have as severe a problem. But the reason they do not fear it uh, like uh, we uh, should is that uh, they know that we will never strike them first. So consequently, not only will we perhaps not have anything to attack uh, their hard targets in the Soviet Union, won't have anything to create an EMP either. Besides, if you look at the location of Moscow to Europe and, and virtually the, the bulk of the Soviet population, that's near our allies and so forth. In other words, not only would we take them out with an with a EMP that was placed at very high altitude, we would possibly take out our own electronic equipment and that of our allies. So the geography greatly favors them, as does their doctrine and strategy uh, versus ours. That is a first strike versus uh, just response. Remind me again of the second question. Why do we maintain the uh, obsolete weapons forces? Okay, he said, why do we maintain the B-52s and the Minuteman uh, in light of their current vulnerability? And the answer to that is, is very direct. Uh, we have no alternatives. You know, we have nothing to replace them with. Therefore, they do represent some level of uncertainty in the Soviet equations. And we, need, we don't need to give away that level of uncertainty. Now, we have decommissioned all of the Titans. They were, at, they, they were at several bases. The last ones we took out were in North Little Rock, and we just finished decommissioning about two weeks ago, the last of those. So they're now gone, and they were the only really large nuclear warheads we had. They were nine megatons. But the reason we took those out, they were very old and very unreliable. You know? And besides, they're, they're what's called city busters. We put in in the early days, and we're not targeted against cities anymore. So, you know, we have, we have no need from them, for them, and they did not have the accuracy and the reliability to take out hard targets. So we unilaterally took those out. Uh, our megatonnage, our total megatonnage, and our total number of weapons, nuclear weapons, has dropped dramatically uh, since 20 years ago. Many people don't know that. You see, we've been b backing off. The Soviets have been going identically the opposite way at even a more dramatic rate. Okay? One more question, and then we'll conclude. There's one okay. more person oh, who wants to ask something. Okay. Um, even if we were completely eliminated by the Russians as a danger, 
The Chinese, for example, would still remain, and while they are a comparatively minor nuclear power, they have a long history of enmity toward the Soviets, and their nuclear capability would be enhanced by being able to catch the Russians in a very vulnerable condition while they would be attacking us. Do you think that would act as much of a deterrence? Well, the, the Chinese, of course, have a very modest nuclear force, and the Soviets have countered that with uh, large numbers of SS-20s that are positioned along their border. They could easily knock out the Chinese force in a strike and, and hit anything else in China they wanted to, and China would have no backup to Could that. Could they do now, that at the same time that they were attacking us? No, I don't think so. And because of this, and again, I'm having to just guess, but I don't think that they would because uh, many people ask the question, well, what would the Chinese do? And my answer to that is in 30 minutes, because that's what you're dealing with, you know. Uh, they wouldn't do anything at first attack. And if the Soviets were successful in that, and in a very short period of time, and it might, the whole thing may take, of course, longer than 30 minutes, but it'll be over in a very short period of time, the Chinese then would not, again, want to commit suicide. So they would perhaps not use those. Now, what the situation you've got is the Soviet Union is the only strategic, major strategic nuclear power in the world. Now, they will hit the French and British nuclear forces at the same time. Mm -hmm. Those they can't take a chance on. Uh, but again, my estimation would be that they probably would not hit the Chinese in, in the first wave. But if the Chinese showed any signs of, uh, of preparations, then they might do that. Thank you. Okay.